Uh, the other thing, just in case you're going to ask a question as I'm preaching, I do have a limp today. Uh, it was a war injury. Uh, I was playing volleyball. <laughs> but I'm walking around this morning, so I'm rejoicing because I was really afraid I had to sit on the stool and preach Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, and if you know me, that just wouldn't work very well. So. Just so you can answer that question, if you're saying, why is Pastor Hoplin? Many of you have already asked me, that's the why. So now we can get beyond that and engage in the Word of God that God has for us today. Uh, I've been preaching a series leading to this morning, and it's been called Easter, and it's been in quotes. And the way we've been looking at it is over the last three weeks, and this will be the fourth sermon series, we've been looking at particular quotes that occur in the passion story of Christ and seeing how they might bring to life some of the story. And this all started back on the Passover meal and Jesus and his disciples, and he tells them they're going to betray him, and they say they're not. And they go to the garden, and Jesus is praying in the garden, and he gives his disciples this instruction to watch and pray. And he comes back and he says, are you sleeping? Three times. And that was the question we looked at first. Are we sleeping, or are we doing the purpose that God has for us? And the garden ended with the, the arrest of Jesus Christ. Remember, the crowd comes and, and Jesus says, wake up, they're here, and he's arrested. So after that came a trial. And his first trial was one that was a religious trial. It was with, with, with the religious elite. And in that trial was our next quote. When they said, are you everything and all these things? And Jesus' response was, I am. The quote was recognizing that Jesus absolutely is fully God. That he is, he was, and he always will be. And because I know that he is the I am, I can recognize who he is in my life. So he had his trials. At the end of that trial, remember, they got very upset. And he was sentenced to death, both through the religious leaders and, and in the, the Roman courts. And, and so last week we looked at Jesus is carrying his cross. And there's an individual who was, who was called out. His name was Simon. And they said, carry his cross. And we talked about the power of carrying the cross of Jesus Christ. That we partner with Christ in this passion story of Christ. And I today get to carry the cross of Jesus Christ. The burden of that cross to others and the burden of that cross in my life. So after Jesus has gone through this, and I'm just going to read through these verses. I've kind of accumulated some of the next from, the, from three different Gospels. It says, um, carrying his own cross... He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side, and Jesus to them. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified near, uh, was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this, that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. So while this, when the soldiers uh, crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares. One for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another, let's decide who will get it. This happened that the scriptures might be fulfilled that said they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. So this is what the soldiers did and one of the criminals who hung there quoted insults at him and said, Are you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him, Don't you fear God? He said, And since you're under the same sentence, well, that would be a good quote right there too, Don't you fear God? But I'm not quoting this morning. <laughs> since you're under the same sentence, we're punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sisters, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And, and when Jesus saw his mother there, the disciples, whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to his disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciples took her into his home. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. This is the Good Friday. This is the narrative that, that you may have pondered on Friday. Eli, 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 which means, my God, my God, 
why have you forsaken me? Later, knowing that everything had been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they sewed the sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head, gave up his spirit, and Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. That's the transition that comes to where they are this morning. Jesus carried the cross. He carried the cross to the hill of Golgotha. There he was crucified. There the work of the gospel was completely accomplished. And once he died, they took him off that cross, right? And they put him in a tomb. And it says, if you want to read in the book of Matthew about this tomb, there were some leaders that were very concerned with, with Jesus and, and, and the, the following that he had. And they heard rumors that Jesus had said he would raise in three days. And so they wanted to make sure this couldn't happen. They watched Jesus die. And so it tells us in the book of Matthew that, that they decided to set guards outside the tomb of Jesus Christ, which they see. They looked at each other and they said, this is the fear. The fear is that Jesus is going to raise him and He said that. He's talked about that. We've heard these crazy rumors. We're going to make sure his crazy followers can't make this happen. Okay? And so they put guards before the tomb. This morning I want to pick up what happens a few days later. Luke chapter 24. Verse 1 says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found a stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Verse 6 says, He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners and be crucified on the third day and raised again. Then they remembered his words. This morning I really want to push in to verse 6. What those angels said to the women. Now the women went to the garden. They went, they went to the tomb that day with spices. Why were they taking spices? I promised they weren't making rounds. They were taking spices because they wanted to anoint the, the, the dead body. They were taking spices to prepare the dead. That's what they were going for. They were taking spices with the expectation of death. So if we put enough cologne, there's some people that do that. They put enough cologne on that they won't think we stink anymore. You know what I'm talking about? Levi, teenage locker room? I wasn't saying Levi did it, but man. <laughs> Sorry about that, Levi. You can't hear it. Just kick my calf. <laughs> they were taking spices there for the very purpose of treating or anointing the body so that people could endure longer to come see the body of Christ. Like, that was the whole point. They would anoint them with enough perfume that if they started stinking, the perfume would come up, cover it long enough for as long as they could, and then they guess they finally see what the But But that was the point. Their intent in going to the tomb that day was for death. And when they arrived at the tomb, they said, first of all, the stone was rolled away, and they didn't understand that. So when they, once the stone was rolled away, they went inside, and they literally saw that Jesus was not there. Now, I'm sure they're confused, and I don't know about you, I would be more than confused if all of a sudden there were these bright people in bright clothing standing next to me when I was in the place where I thought someone was dead. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the angels look at them, and the first thing they say, He is not here. I will say that is the story of Easter. That is the profound nature of Easter. The reality that those angels looked at those women and said, He is not here. Here, because really in my mind, there's only two logical solutions for him not being there. I mean, there's only two possibilities. 
One of them involves the disciples, and one of them involves Jesus' work. But, but they, they have to wrestle with these two possibilities. The reality that they're getting is, yeah, thanks. He's not here. We check. He is not here. So if he is not here, why is he not here? Huh? I mean, that's the first question I would ask. If he is not here, why is he not here? And recall, I talked about the guards, and I talked about the authorities in the book of Matthew. Well, they came up with a story after the resurrection, after they heard what had happened. The guards reported that, that the stone was rolled away. They went back, and it says, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that happened. And they're talking about all that really happened. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them they were to save his disciples. His disciples came during the night and stole him away while they were asleep. If this report gets the, to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So here again, this is the first possible possibility, right? That Jesus' disciples, they showed up in the middle of the night, they rolled what is done, they, they beat up the guards, they, they whatever the guards, and they took the body of Jesus Christ. So that's the first possible uh, possibility in this story. And that's, that's the one that, that was prepared or circulated to respond to this. This profound truth. Well, I just want to present this morning an argument to that probable or that plausible uh, solution. Because what happened, if you read the, the, the resurrection account of, of of Jesus, the women, they go back. And you know who they can talk to? The disciples. How do the disciples respond when the women talk to them? Does anyone know? Yeah. It says they can't believe them. Now I have trouble believing that the women would be surprised that Jesus, or that the disciples would be surprised that Jesus was not there. And not believe them. Now, if I stole Jesus. If I stole a body of Jesus and someone came and said, he's not there, oh, I'll believe that. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, we might get to that place, but that wasn't the case. Now, that's not the only proof I've got of that. Remember Peter in this story? Peter was the one who at the Lord's Supper, we talked about the Last Supper. Christ said, you're going to deny me three times, and he said, what? Ain't no way. All these other guys are terrible. They're weak. They're going to fall away, but not me, Jesus. Never. I mean, he was bold in his faith. And then what happened to Peter? When he was standing by the fire, and a little tiny girl was talking to him and said, Weren't you the one that wants to with Jesus? I mean, the most intimidating figure in the world. It wasn't the guard that scared him, it was a little girl that scared him and caused him to deny Christ three times. That's who Peter was. I mean, that's how bold Peter was. Well, what happens in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 3 when Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit? Scripture says he stands before thousands and begins to preach about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, how could Peter, the one who said he would never deny Jesus, the one who was so bold in his faith, but then was so scared of punishment when it came to a little girl, stand before a crowd of 2,000, 3,000 people and begin to preach the truth of a resurrected Jesus. Does that make sense? Peter, James, Lesser, James, the greater Simon, Thaddeus, Matthew, Nathaniel, Philip, all of them, guess what happened to them? The ones who supposedly stole his body, all of them face death or die because of the truth of the resurrection. Now, man, I don't know, maybe. Can you imagine one person dying for a lie, let alone 11 people, and another one born in oil? So I gotta imagine at some point when John was being born in oil, he could easily say, hey, this isn't. They never said. So I think it's very fair to say that that first <coughs> scenario isn't likely. It didn't happen. So if that didn't happen, then what did happen? The angel answered it right away. He said, Pastor, the angel answered it in no time. You took like 10 minutes to answer the question. 
I'm, I'm not as spiritual as an angel. So, if they didn't steal his body, the angel looked at those ladies and said, He is not here. Why? He has risen. That's the only other answer. That's the only other way. That's the only other possibility in this scenario was if he wasn't stolen, he must have risen. Maybe, just maybe, what he said would be accomplished was truly being accomplished. What entered into the tomb was death, but what came out of the tomb was everlasting life. That's the hope of Easter. He's not here. He has risen. Well, because he has risen, what does that mean to me? Because he's risen, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all come in what? He is risen. He is not here. He is risen. So I have life. I have new life. I have eternal life. Yes, death, that was sin, came through one man, that was Adam. But this was taken care of. When, when the answer came that he rose from the grave, the reality was I have hope for, for life. I have hope <laughs> eternal. Not only life or hope. First Peter says, Praise be to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy. He's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. I want to tell you, because of what the angel expressed, because of the reality that he is not here, because of the reality that he has risen, you have an inheritance that cannot perish, that cannot spoil, that cannot fade. I don't know if we truly embrace that truth, that I have an inheritance that is what God has for me, that cannot perish, that cannot spoil, and that cannot fade. That is what the promise of the resurrection is for you. That the inheritance, the plans, the promises that God has, when He called you a child of God, when I become a child of God, these inheritances are mine. It cannot be taken. It has been sealed. He's risen. I have hope. I have inheritance. In Romans chapter 6, I'm going to read a couple of verses in there. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, if we die in Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the promise that he has risen, that he is not here, means that yes, I have hope, that yes, I have inheritance, but I also have a life. It's the life that we now live in him. So often we continue to live in death. So often we continue to live in the reality of the two. We let sin define us. We let sin and the effects of sin become who we are. So often we identify ourselves with the sin that's in our lives. But the reality that I want to speak right now is that sin was defeated when he raised the dead. The effect, the title, the calling of sin on your life was taken away when he came out. Because when he came out, he came out new. The effect, all that was, was gone. He's not here. That's what the angel said. He is here. But he's not there. He is risen. In the book of Matthew, if you look at it in these verses, the next line is just as he said. I love it. He's not here. You see, the, the authorities knew what he said. They were scared of what he said. He's not here. You see, he's risen just as he said. It's the resurrection of Jesus, the confirmation of his truth. It's the resurrection of Jesus, the affirmation 
that what he said is true. I mean, talk about of all the things that he could possibly say. Hey, I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm going to be raised from the dead. That's got to be about the most preposterous statement he could have ever made. Yet he said that, and, and he proved it. It's proven just as he said. The angels say, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. That is what Jesus Christ said. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said. What did Jesus Christ say? He says in John chapter 11, Mary Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's the word of God. That is what Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. Just as he said, he proved himself in the resurrection. He proved himself through the angels. He proved himself through the empty tomb. Just as he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even though they die, they will live. Do you believe this? It's just as he said. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God, and the Word was with God. Later on, it says, that very Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The promises that Jesus Christ speaks in the Gospel, they're as true as the promises that was revealed in the tomb on that day. Those promises are yours this day. When Jesus spoke to the religious leaders and He said, I am, that means that I can believe what He said. He is. He is God. And because of Him, I am forgiven. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the price for my sin has been paid. Just as He said. When Jesus was on the cross, we read the story, and it said He cried out in a loud voice, It is finished. It's just as He said. It's finished. What was finished? What was finished? His work was complete. The sacrifice for sin, the price for the sin of man, the thing that had separated man from God from the very beginning had been taken care of. The work of the cross was fully accomplished. And what I love is, is that word, and, and this is going to get a little bit uh, English or whatever, it's in the perfect tense. <coughs> when he said it is finished, in that tense, it means it, it, it happened, it's still in effect, and it will continue to happen. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, he meant it is finished in the past, it is still finished in the present, and it remains finished in the future. Amen. Just as he said, it is finished. I want to tell you this morning, the power of sin in your life is finished. The effect of sin in your life is finished. The price for sin in your life has been paid. Just as he said. The scripture says, after they were reminded, those women remembered. They remembered he is not here because he's risen, just as he said. There's a verse I talk about often. It's Romans chapter ten, verse nine. It says, "If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord." and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If we remember 
We live in the promises that God has for us. You know, I, I, this isn't in my notes, but I'm going to go on a tangent just for a moment. It, we hear a, a story about the resurrection of Christ where the disciples are on a road to Emmaus. I believe it's, it's later in Luke, and, and they're walking. And the scripture tells us they're without hope. They're walking, and they don't know who's walking with us. It's the speakers are strained, and they don't know who it is. They're walking. He's probably living a little bit in his camp, I bet. And he said, don't you know what's been going on these days? And well, I don't know, what is it? And they start telling the story of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the resurrected Jesus. Think of the reality they're living in. Because they look at the resurrected Jesus. I just said, the resurrection means I have hope. I can't live without hope. The resurrection tells me that this world isn't all there is. And praise God, I know that. That's what the resurrection tells me, that I have hope for eternal life with Jesus Christ. And there were men living in an alternate reality because they looked at Jesus and they said, we had hope. Their hearts were downcast, the scripture says. Why? Because they were living in a reality that they chose. They weren't living in the reality that God had accomplished. And I pray that this morning that we're not living in the reality that we've chosen, but we're living in the reality that God has accomplished. That just as he said, we're recognizing that yes, sin causes death. There's no way around that. Sin separates us from God. The effect of sin is, is the eternal death. Just as he said, but just as he said, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So I can choose to live in a reality without that hope, or I can choose to live in the reality of that hope. Amen. And it's when I remember what he's done. But I live in that place. If there could be some gentlemen come forward, we're going to conclude with, with communion this morning. Worship team is going to come up. As they're passing these elements out, I'll just tell you guys there's some extras in the kitchen if you need Or when you Wait, wait, wait one second. Wait one second. It's a special person. Just because I know we've got a lot of guests today. Communion in our church. We call it open communion. What that means is we want every believer to participate in this moment. And if you've never confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, if you've never believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that, that's what scripture says it takes for us to be saved. And so before we pass out communion, I, I want an opportunity to pray with us as a body that we can accept what Jesus Christ has done. Because what I want to do, I would hate to invite you to supper and not let you have a place at my table. And I'm not trying to manipulate you right now. I'm just trying to give you an opportunity to remember truly what we're celebrating. Amen. And so I don't have to be too formal with this. I'm not going to make you raise a hand or stand up or whatever else. But I do want to pray. And if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, if you confess with your mouth that He is Lord, that means that He has the authority in your life. That that maybe once you were living under the authority of sin, which means that sin got to determine your authority, but today you say, no, I want to live under the authority of Jesus Christ to make Him my Lord. It's as simple as that. No longer do I want to be identified by my sin, but I want to be identified by my Christ. Yes. Amen. I'm going to pray, and I'm just going to ask you, if you'll, if you'll pray with me, but, but in these moments, if this is something that you need to confess, that you need to profess, make sure you let God know that. Father, we thank you this morning that he is not there. God, we thank you that he has risen. Just as he said. God, we thank you that the Word of God declares that you love us. That you love us so much you sent your one and only Son to die so that we might have life. I thank you that Jesus came to this world. That he lived. That he taught. That he died and paid the price 
for my sin. That's the sin that I've done. That's the sin that I'm, that I'm dealing with. And that's the sin that is coming. And because of the cross and the assurance of the resurrection that death has been defeated, I can live with hope just as He said. Help us to receive your love as we remember this day in Jesus' name. We're going to lead us in a chorus and we'll pass out the elements. He's not here. He's here. Just as he said. And then they remember. And now we remember. Scripture says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, and I was betrayed. He took some bread and when he gave him thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ, which was broken for you. I'm going to pray for God's blessing on this element. Father, we thank you for the body of Christ. The body that was broken so that we could find a place. The body that was used to bring about the salvation of man. To bring about my redemption cross that was carried so that I could be redeemed. I'm going to thank you for that and I receive the fullness of the body of Christ in Jesus' name. Let us continue. It says in the same way after supper he took a cup saying this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it remember to me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said. Now we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness and the promise that is in this cup. And we ask God that we would receive the fullness of that, that we can live with the reality of that promise in our lives. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you for what Jesus shed so that we might have eternal life. In Jesus' name, let us partake. something, but I'm just going to say, the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face shine upon you, be gracious to you, may He turn His face towards you and grant you with His peace. And may you live knowing He is not there. He's risen. Yeah. Just as He said. Amen? Amen. Amen. Be blessed.